Hey, handsome, how are you? Oh, that's so nice of you to say that. I, uh, I'm doing well. He's uh, old. I am. I, it's, uh, I'm uh, another year older and much less wiser is, uh, is how it's going for me here. Uh, but, Tom, I'm curious about the Dynasty. We've read a few excerpts from it. Uh, I haven't seen any clips yet, though I'm very much looking forward to watching the first two episodes, which air tomorrow on Apple TV. You're a part of this. Uh, you've seen it. You were, uh, again, featured in it. What uh, yeah. what jumps out to you from the the experience and what you've had to, to see so far? That it cuts out the middleman in terms of each episode is now in the hands of the individuals who lived it in a completely unreserved and unedited way. You know, if I, I can quote people, I can write things, I can, you know, have some sound that I am doctoring in a particular way and editing for a piece. But when you have a documentary that's discussing so in-depth all of these topics, you're kind of going to get the unvarnished <clears throat> and honest and open opinions. And, you know, I talked to the director, Matt Hamachek, who I think was on with Fresh and Fourier he earlier was. today. I talked to today, and he said... You know, the great thing about this is some people were very difficult to convince, Adam Vinatieri being a prime one, because they're like, well, why is this different from all the other stuff? And this is because they all ended up recognizing, whether it's Brandon Lloyd, who's unbelievable in the Aaron Hernandez episode, which is a full episode unto itself, to Vinatieri, to Ernie Adams. They all just let fly. And that's what makes this different. I think they all understood, I'm going to do this one time. I'm going to say my truth and then see you later. And I think that's what makes this, sets this apart is there's no punch pulling. Tommy, you mentioned there the Aaron Hernandez episode. I think a lot of people, when they first got the trailer of this, they thought maybe it'll be a little raw emotion, but a lot of nostalgia because it is the dynasty. So it's looking back on decades of winning. Would you say that it's a very nostalgic series or should people expect a different tone and expect to feel differently about some of the people who they've regarded as heroes here? You're going to feel every feeling. You're going to feel incredibly nostalgic as you watch the first two episodes. You're going to feel nostalgic when you watch, honestly, I think one of the most powerful episodes is the Spygate one in terms of just you get to digest again how absolutely dominant they were and there's no editing and these guys are liberal with the F-bombs both in talking to the camera nice. and both in talking to the camera and in the clips. Belichick is a walking F-bomb from the 07 season and they have clip after clip after clip but to me there's nostalgia, there's plenty of times where you you know the hair on the back of your neck will stand up there's plenty of times where you're like, oh, I didn't know that. And there's plenty of times where you will um, say that that's pretty effed up. And the Hernandez one is a pretty effed up one. I mean, Dion Branch is one of the most powerful interviews there in that he says, how could I not know? How could I not know? And because he was Hernandez's closest friend. And there's a million anecdotes in the Hernandez episode that are like, holy crap, he was a psychopath. How do you think Bill felt about the project? Hated it. <laughs> and I think that that's so biggest, that's so unlike him. I'm surprised at that. Well, w what's going to be really striking for people is watching the first two episodes and seeing just how different Bill is in 2000 and 2001 than he is in 2024. I mean, obviously, he visually looks different, as we all do after 25 years of aging. When you get into your 70s, you're going to look different than you did at 45. But his... Tenor in 2000, while he did come in under, well, he's, you know, a misanthrope and he doesn't get along with anybody. I had a blast with the guy. I had a blast with the guy until 2017, just like everybody else. Why would have covering, <laughs> covering him. Um, but the 2000 bill and the way he operated and the way he communicated and the way he went in depth and the way he explained things was a really, that's something you're going to be nostalgic about and say, oh, I forgot how how enjoyable he was and how frank and blunt he was, but how introspective and explanatory he was. Um, but, you know, this was a book written by Jeff Benedict. Jeff Benedict, in large part, explained to Robert Kraft, I want to write a book about the dynasty. I want to write a book that explains the vision of the three protagonists here. And nobody had really gone to Robert and said, I want to write it this way. I want to hear your version of things. So 
I think that in telling that book story through Robert's eyes, it was frequently at least marginalized a little bit, even though I think it's a great book. It's, oh, this is, this is Kraft's version of things. And you can, and I think the Belichick went into it believing that and saying, I know how this is going to end for me when this thing comes out. But it's important to note that Belichick went in for those interviews in June or July. I can't remember which month it was. That was prior to the Patriots going 4-13. and 13. That was them at a time when they hoped that the season would work out and Bill would be here infinitely. And Bill was already in a position where he just wasn't playing in this, uh, and you'll see it at length in this documentary, the number of times he says, I'm not commenting on that, or I've already talked about that, or just gives a blank three-word answer, and then the camera doesn't blink and just sticks on him as he adjusts his jaw. So there's a lot of that. I don't think Bill liked it. I don't think Bill's going to love it, but it is not slanted because when you have Matthew Slater or Devin McCourty or, you know, in giving a very unvarnished opinion that is unflattering to Bill on the way he created an atmosphere in the latter portions of the, the dynasty, you can't really argue. This is not slanted. This is how they saw it, how they felt it. Did Bill feel a right to do that and say, this is the way I've always done it, I'm going to keep doing it? Absolutely. But did it work? No. Tom, just to swing it back to the uh, present day team here, uh, we're about two months away from the draft and we've heard all sorts of different uh, reports on what the Patriots may be thinking about doing. Any movement recently and uh, are they leaning any particular way on uh, February 15th? I wouldn't say there's any movement in terms, Christian, of, hey, we've changed our mind, we're going to do this. I will say this. I'll characterize the team's mindset leaving Las Vegas as being very much comprehending the importance of coach slash quarterback. That's the foundation, or actually not, I wouldn't say that's the foundation. I would say that is what you have to have in order to win championships. Now, I don't know if they believe it's the foundation, but I did not miss the pointed nature of the commentary when I was there from people who would know that it's important. It's an important position. Quarterback is critical. Does that mean they're taking the quarterback? I don't know. Does that mean they're trading down? I think that Robert Kraft is going to leave that to his, as he calls them, gurus to decide. What's interesting is that if quarterback is important to your ownership and you feel as if you're on a probationary period, as Elliot Wolf and Matt Crow may feel, it's going to take some stones to say, yeah, trading down, taking Joe Walt. We're going to have two first-rounders next year. We're going to move up. Or, nah, we're going to take MHJ, Marvin Harrison Jr. Because the easiest thing to do is, if you're in a probationary period, do what you believe the organization wants you to do. So that's very much present as we talk about, as I push back on the notion that the crafts are marionettes uh, or puppeteers, whichever it is, Mego, you could tell me. Um, I, I think it's, there is inherent pressure on these people to please their bosses. If I remember Sound of Music, it's the puppeteers who are working the marionettes. We know you remember the Sound of Music. Yes, I do. I don't know if you know this, Tom, but I have quite a liking for Captain Von Trapp. He's very much my type. Uh, we all, we've all heard. <laughs> Those baby blues. Um, I, I'm wondering after watching the Super Bowl, do you, do you, I know you've been talking about the value of trading back and collecting assets and building out over a couple of drafts. Do you feel any differently about staying at number three and taking a quarterback high personally? As a guy who used to sit in your chairs from two to six, used to say, I watched that Super Bowl and my reaction was, you're making my point. <laughs> <laughs> that Super Bowl, look, there's Patrick Mahomes and Tom Brady, and maybe you could have Peyton Manning in the same zip code, but Rodgers isn't there with Brady and Mahomes. He's different. He's Jordan. He's Gretzky. Brady is Babe Ruth in terms of what he has authored over the course of time, but you can already say that Mahomes can do exquisite things the way that Brady did. Brady's just resume is so far beyond, but you're not going to find Mahomes or Brady, and if you do, you're going to find them in a place you didn't think you were going to find them. Maybe 10th overall, maybe 199. But when you get them, you better have a team that you can afford to sit them for a year, like both of the teams did. And you better have a good team 
around him. And the Patriots were a good team, despite the fact they had a 5 out 11 record with Bill the first year, because they had all of those defensive players that I'm not going to roll through to save time. But they had a core. And then when Brady took over, the team improved because they got right with the salary cap and were able to add players. I look at this and I say, okay, the best way to build is like San Francisco or Philadelphia or even Houston, which was not just dropped in a quarterback and turned magically good. They added tackles and tight ends and wide receivers. and They had a personnel guy. So I think the point is, if you want to get to the Super Bowl and be sniffing around it, you get a better chance of doing it like San Fran or Philadelphia or even the Philadelphia of 2017 did than you do of trying to find Patrick Mahomes or Tom Brady. So that's why I argue. Do you think Jaden Daniels can be Mahomes, Brady, or – somebody like that, go ahead. But if you think that he might be tur- turn into can- cannon fodder, which I think there's a very strong chance of that, you don't want him to be another in the long line of guys taking on the top three who went to too bad a team to ever have a shot at succeeding. Okay, here's Tommy Curran. He joins us every Thursday here on Jones and Mega with Arcan on WEEI. Tom, we appreciate the time. We're looking forward to seeing you in these, uh, these episodes of the Dynasty coming up tomorrow. Thank you. Do you, do you guys hate that take? Which? The last one. Oh, Building out like San Fran and Philly. No, no, no. I, I, made, I made a little bit of a face when you, you said Houston had a lot of stuff in place, but we've been through that before. I, no, I want the quarterback. You know me. I want the quarterback. I'm a, sim- I'm, I'm a simpleton. I, know, I like, I like I'm shiny not, objects. I I'm not saying I don't. I just think they're not. I think they're going to think out loud next year. Okay. I agree with that. Well, we'll be talking about it a lot. Uh, we appreciate the time, Tom. Thanks so much. Thanks, Tommy. See you guys. All right, Tommy Curran is all our guest, joins us on the Harbor One Hotline. Good stuff on the dynasty. Good stuff on what the Patriots are doing at quarterback.